The panel discussion on transition and turbulence will be led by the policy director of the energy section at the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Hans Olav Ibrek. First, uh, let me thank uh, former President uh, Grimson for presenting the key conclusions of uh, this important uh, report that we just presented about half a year ago and that I'm really proud that the Norwegian government actually took the initiative to. First, let me start with uh, following up from Christiania. So this is her 40 gigaton that she mentioned yesterday. And President Grimson said actually when he started, it's all about energy. Yesterday, IEA presented some really, I wouldn't say really encouraging, actually discouraging figures in their global emission report from 2018. Emissions from the energy sector amounted to 33 gigatons. So that means two-thirds of these 40 is actually coming from the energy sector. The bad news is that emissions went up 1.8% last year. So we are definitely going in the wrong direction. This is the highest gr annual growth since 2013. Of course, you need to look at this from temperature perspectives, et cetera, et cetera, but it's, it's not really encouraging. It's also, uh, when we look at decoupling from economic growth and emissions, the increase last year was half a percent increase in emissions for every 1% economic growth. It used to be 0.3%, again, we're going in the wrong direction. This will definitely have geopolitical consequences. And no President Grimson has presented to you what we can achieve by undertaking this energy transformation. So we have a great panel with us today. So let me introduce them. We have Samantha Smith. The whole panel can come. She is the director of the Just Transition Center from the International Trade Union Confederation. Tina Saltvet, chief analyst, sustainable finance, Nordea. And then Indra Erveland, head of Center for Energy Research from the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs. And then, in addition, President Grimson will also join the panel. This is actually the first time I've been on the energy panel where we have uh, gender, we have complied with the more gender rules uh, because normally it's just uh, full of men with gray hair and uh, we have some of them here also. So we will be, be, be trying then to follow up uh, some of the discussions that you've uh, had uh, before. First, let me turn to Tina Saltvet. Tina is following the energy markets uh, on a daily, I guess, maybe on an hourly or minute-wise uh, basis. Um, no, President Grimson has presented uh, his and the Commission view on what will uh, the implications of the, geo of the transformation that is now ongoing. Do you agree with the analysis that he has presented and the conclusions? Yes, I must say that um, um, it is possible, uh, actually, to, to reach the goals we want to, but uh, of course it will be challenging for very many nations. Uh, because we have uh, a lot of nations that are dependent on fossil fuel production. And of course, uh, to make this transformation, uh, they have to find a new way of growing their economies. And that is, of course, uh, a big challenge. One thing is the income from the sales of, uh, and production of oil, gas and coal. How should you replace that? And uh, not at least, I think another important dimension is not only the countries, but the people. The people who is working in the industry. It's so important that we find new places where they can work, because the opposition will of course come from people that are losing their job, losing their future income. So doing that, doing this transformation uh, in a way where we can create jobs as well are very, very important. Is that possible? Of course it's possible. It's very much in our head what we want to do. The willingness 
to do something comes from a self. And in a period with transmission, there will be companies, there will be people that feel threatened about changes, but there will also be a lot of new opportunities rising. And I think it's important to look at opportunities, because if you're open to change the way you're doing things today, you will also find these opportunities, and you will also feel much more obliged and also more triggered to change. So I think for sure uh, that talking positively about this change is important as well. The transform uh, transformation we have to do in the energy system, because they are for sure important. Uh, I think um, what we have seen, for example, oil uh, specifically, uh, it's also important to see how that has been used as a political tool. And it's not only it has been, it is being used as a political tool. So in that kind of sense, to look at uh, power, uh, the, the uh, transformation of power here, is also important. A very recent example is, uh, for example, the US have put sanctions on um, both uh, Iran and also uh, other uh, energy producing countries. And why do the pit, why are they so interested in that? And why are these sanctions working? Uh, because, uh, for example, when, when the US uh, were putting sanctions on Iran, what, kind, what sector and what did they target? Of course, the sanctions are very much specified to target the oil industry, because they know that hitting the oil industry will hit Iran's income. Uh, a lot of the income to the country as well. So in this way, you can use you can actually use the energy source as a, uh, as a tool of power. We've seen that before as well in the oil crisis in 1973. It was also used as a political tool. So in, in many of the, the wars and many of these uh, political fights, energy has been used as a political tool because the world today is very, very dependent on oil and we, we need to reduce that dependence. Uh, but of course, that also means that some powers will lose their power. And then I thought I would uh, pick up on something that the last pa panel was talking about. And the ambassador from the Seychelles was uh, very, very correct, uh, correctly pinpointing. Because countries such as Norway, for example, uh, we have a very big paradox we're living in at the moment. Uh, because, uh, as you said, yes, we have double the amount of money which is going into a green fund supporting the islands which, uh, which is now facing a big crisis or, or big uh, challenges with the sea level rise or the, change, the climate changes. But at the same time we open up for a lot of new oil production. That is a paradox. Why are we not doing something with the real source to this problem? Uh, and that is the production and uh, consumption of oil and energy. Of, of fossil fuels. That is where we should target. That is, so, that is really where we can do something with the problem of rising sea levels or changing in the climate. Why are we not doing something with that? Instead, we keep on, uh, we keep on producing oil and we, we rather you know, increase the amount, uh, amount of money going into these, uh, these kind of fun. So I think we... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So I think we have to do something with the willingness in our heads to really do something. And I think that also says something about the economic system, because there must be some real, something really, really wrong with the economic system that, to let these kind of things happening. I think that we do not pay enough for the emissions we have. We need to put a price on these emissions, and we need to put that cost. For example, it cannot be, be right or cannot be fair that the Seychelles now maybe have to move some part of the, the, uh, uh, the houses, some part of the, the people living on the Seychelles because the sea level is rising. That is an enormous cost for a small country. At the same time, I, I'm very pretty sure that the Seychelles has not have this uh, enormous amount of CO2 emissions that could actually cause the sea level to rise that much. So it's a very unfair di um, division of the costs connected to the uh, climate change. For example, we in Norway, we have not had the big cost of climate change yet, but still we earn a lot of money of uh, exporting and producing oil. So I think the f the, there's something very wrong with the economic system that actually let us do this. So I think we have to put a more fair price on, on the 
uh, emissions. Uh, I think that has to be incorporated into the economic system. So actually the money, the capital is moving in a more sustainable, uh, sustainable direction. It's actually incalculating the, also the cost of polluting, which we're not doing today. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Could I just ask uh, Tina to follow up one question? You brought up a number of issues that I will introduce uh, later, but is the money moving in the right direction from your perspective? In that kind of sense, it's interesting because something is starting to happen. And um, I used to work as an oil analyst. Now I work in um, the financial sector with sustainable finance. And I must say that within the last even three quarter of a year, you really see that companies are starting to focus on sustainability. They're starting to actually, um, it's starting actually to grasp the thing that sustainability has to be in, uh, or incorporated into the business models. For example, we have now as a bank starting to actually make um, a ranking or uh, of all the companies we're now investing in, but also the, all the companies we're lending money to, according to their CO2 footprint, uh, the climate, uh, uh, we, we put some kind of climate uh, emission of footprint, and also the way they're working with sustainability. So actually the way the companies now are working with sustainability and climate issues will have an impact on the access to money via the financial market. Uh, if you will get a loan, uh, if actually we will invest in the company. Uh, so things are starting to happen. We're starting actually to put a price on sustainability and climate. It's not moving fast enough. We have to speed up this. But does it have an effect? And I can give you one example, which, is, uh, which we've been working with the last uh, two weeks, because Amazonas, for example, the, the big uh, the fires in Amazonas, uh, actually our asset management division, they said, okay, we will stop actually buying and supporting the, um, uh, the Brazilian government, uh, because we don't think that the, the, or, or the business model is supporting the, um, uh, the Paris Agreement. So we actually stopped, we put a freeze on the assets we have uh, connected to Amazonas. And what happened? Well, yesterday, actually, the, the Brazilian ambassador rang us up and said, what could we do to change this so you will start investing again? So in that kind of sense, you could see that actually what we're doing with the capital, that we're starting you know, to put a price on the risk connected to sustainability, connected with climate changes, could actually have an effect on where the capital is moving in the future. But we have to move much faster and we have to be much stricter. So I think this is a tiny start. Thank you, uh, Tina. You also brought up the issue of the, the workers and new opportunities. And you also mentioned some of the vested interests that we also discussed in the, in the last uh, session. Um, Samantha, to bring you in, um, just transition was sort of the, I would say, probably the key word at uh, COP24, the last year's uh, climate uh, conference. And it was a really strong call then uh, for a just transition. And of course, a transition moving from sort of the oil, the old oil and gas industry changing the energy uh, sector towards renewable will imply new, will get new opportunities as well. It has some cost for someone. What, in order to achieve a just transition, what are the sort of the key issues that you would like to, to bring in, into this debate? Mm. Well, so thanks, hans -Ulev. I mean, just transition is a concept that comes out of the labor movement, um, and uh, we're pretty proud of that, and we're, uh, we were also very excited to see a global guideline on just transition negotiated between 163 countries, employers, and unions in the International Labor Office, which is a UN agency. Um, just transition is also in the Paris Agreement. So from the labor movement perspective, if you're going to deliver the Paris Agreement, it has to be with a just transition and the creation of decent work and quality employment. Um, what is a just transition? It's really two things. So first of all, when I would say a lot of people, when you think about just transition, you immediately go straight to coal miners in Poland or in East, the former Eastern Germany or in Appalachia, and you think it's about coal miners in a sort of one industry region, and what will we do for them um, if, uh, if coal is going to be phased out? 
but actually Just Transition is at least as much about improving existing jobs, making them low emissions, and making sure that new jobs are actually decent jobs. And here I want to, to speak to the young sisters and brothers in the audience, right? Because this is also a generational issue about the quality of work. So if you're told you're going to go from a job in a coal mine, let's say, where you have secure employment, you think you might have lifetime employment, maybe not, you have health care, you have pension, um, you have organized labor that's standing up for you, and you're told, okay, your alternative is that you're going to be installing solar panels on a zero hours contract at a third of the wages that you're currently getting um, without secure employment and with no opportunities to organize, you're not necessarily going to be for that. So a just transition is about all of the things that you need to have in place so that as you are transforming a sector, because, for example, in Germany, um, they're not just going to phase out coal-fired power by 2038, they're also going to increase the amount of renewable energy in their power system to 65%. They're going to add a lot of energy storage. They're going to drive energy efficiency. They're going to redevelop regions in East Germany, which were left behind after reunification, right? So it's a broader program of work. And the elements are no one is left behind, so no worker, but also not people in communities are going to be left behind. Uh, social protection based on fair tax, because frankly, you know, a lot of this requires collective action and to have collective action by government, you have to have fair tax. Um, Social protection means income support. If you're unemployed, if you're under education or training, if you're ill, if you're old, if you're having children so that you can live a life of dignity. It's accessible and affordable public services. So not just healthcare, but also education, other things. Decent work. I mentioned the quality of jobs as being very important, not just wages, but also benefits, security of contract. The labor rights that are also human rights, freedom of association and expression. Inclusion, so that people are today locked out of our economies that they, and prosperity, that they are also able to participate and to get good jobs. Um, and finally, this aspect of regional redevelopment, because in some of these regions, if you say, we're going to close down the mines and we're going to close down the power plants, um, even in a five-year perspective, we're not going to do anything to ensure that there are new jobs. That is a recipe for the far right and for fascism. I'll just put it out there. And we see that in country after country. Thank you. Um, just to follow up a little bit on, on Germany, there sort of a, I wouldn't say it's a paradox, but the commission has made a recommendation that it can phase out all coal by 2035, remembering also Christiania's uh, interventions uh, yesterday, in the sense it, it takes 20 years. From the analysis uh, that we've now presented, and also what uh, former President Grimson said, in the sense, can we then wait for 20 years until Germany has uh, made this transformation? Or how can we, from your perspective, speed up this transformation to ensure that all uh, we have decent work uh, and that we have uh, no one is left behind. Well, so it is actually less than 20 years because we're talking 2038 and we're moving quickly towards 2020. But having said that, uh, 1820 is not uh, that much the difference. But yeah, anyway. but the difference between 2035 so. and 2038 is also not enormous. So look. German unions were pushing for the coal commission to be set up by the government for several years before it actually happened, right? And when it did happen, uh, unions, the mining and energy unions were at the table throughout the whole process. The second there was, an, they were talking to members on the ground in the coal regions. The second an agreement was reached, they sprinted out of there and started socializing the agreement with workers so that there is actually solid support for the process that has been negotiated where some 25,000 organized workers in what are some of the best jobs in these regions, their jobs are going to disappear. Appear. And that's a pretty big thing in a big industrial economy like Germany or anywhere else. Um, I guess, so I can't predict the future trajectory of this process of 
transitioning away from coal in Germany. What I can say is that as long as the process is just and is complying with all the things that were negotiated, including a package of regional redevelopment for things like high-speed rail, um, research institutions, hospitals, and schools, things that make it good for people to live and stay in the region, unions are behind it. The other thing I, I also want to say, because we do get this question a lot, is what is, you know, what is your alternative? Before the Commission negotiated this agreement, Germany had zero plan for transition of the power sector, no plan for how they were going to phase out coal, right? And so, uh, you know, people who are saying, well, this isn't fast enough, it's not ambitious enough, like my question back to them is, what are you going to do? Are you going to send in the tanks? Um, that's really not something we want to see again in Europe. It's about the political economy of the energy sector, so this is, uh, this is really important. But just uh, to all the young people in the audience here, uh, Irina just published a report uh, a while back uh, saying there are 11 million jobs in renewable energy. So even I would really encourage a lot of you to actually uh, look into the energy sector, because in order to, uh, to get to the transformation that we really need, we need a lot of you to come in into this uh, sector. And uh, there's a lot of stuff happening. So if you have the, our interest, uh, move in that direction. I'm trying to convince my girl, uh, my daughter, in order to do that. But it's, dif I've, it's difficult, but uh, we'll see. <coughs> um, just to pick up another uh, point that uh, Tina said before I bring in the other panelists, but I would like to go back to, uh, to uh, former President Grimson. Um, Tina said that energy has been used as a political tool in the sort of the future that we have now envisaged as part of this, uh, the, 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 the work that has been done through the Commission. Is then energy, will it still be a political tool to the same extent? Well, of course, it's difficult to predict exactly because what we are seeing is a transformation of the world and it is a very dynamic transformation. Uh, let me just take this analogy of uh, how we buy our food. Uh, uh, most of my life we went to small shops and bought our foods and then we had supermarkets and then the supermarkets uh, a few years ago decided to let us check the, uh, the goods ourselves as we left the supermarket. There was nobody on the desk and we just paid with our credit card. Now people are starting to even stop going to the supermarket and they order all, all their food online. And nobody planned this. It happened in the combination of technology and the market. And it's happening very fast. And I think the same thing is happening with energy. You can now buy a Korean electric car in my country, a family car. And if you drive it reasonably for five years when you want a new car, the difference you have saved from the petroleum car to the electric car is enough to cover the price of the new car. So anybody in their right mind will buy an electric car because it is, in fact, cheaper. So what I'm trying to tell you is I think the combination of what's happening in the marketplace and what's happening in the technological place will really outpace those who want to use power to influence this process. It might sound strange coming from somebody who spent most of his life in politics in one way or another, but I think the political world has really lost control of this process. Of course, you can try to speed it up and influence it with enlightened policies and so on. I, I'm not saying that. But the beauty of the clean energy plus the technology and the marketplace is that we are no longer dependent on centralized decision makers. And I think, as the report kind of points out, that both the big energy companies as well as the government might find them soon stranded with an old, old-fashioned economic structure of the fossil fuel economy and have the challenge, how are they going to deal with it? But like the political leaders suddenly find themselves with 
millions of young people on the street. Mm. Nobody planned that. Yes, of course, a young Swedish girl and young Norwegians had a role in it. But anybody who's brought up in traditional power structure analysis would have thought it crazy that kids could have a political impact of this kind. But it's happening. So I think what we are seeing, and I think that's actually a very good news, is that the clean energy technology plus the information sector and the marketplace is in fact transforming it. Plus, in Asia and other cities, the fear of pollution. We, we should not forget that. Mm -hmm. Because for young people in Asia, if you were in China or other Asian cities with, with your age, you would face the threat that your kids would get diseases before they're 10 years old. How many people do you think died last year of pollution in cities, directly because of pollution? Seven million people. Seven million people. It's the fourth biggest killer in the world. And it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, we all breathe the same air. That is one of the reasons why the Asian governments and city authorities and others are transforming it in this way. So the answer to your question is really this. Yes, it will change the power structure, but I think this dynamic force which is taking place in front of our eyes is going into places which none of us can actually predict. Hopefully, I believe, it will bring us to a good place, but there is, of course, no guarantee that it actually will in sufficient time to save the planet. Before I bring in the political scientist, Tina, you were in hot pursuit of uh, something <laughs> that uh, uh, Olafur just said. Yeah, uh, yeah because I, I, I totally agree that because the cost of producing, for example, solar power, wind power, has fallen so sharply and so fast, it's actually go beyond what most of the marketplace uh, have anticipated and also the politicians. Uh, but still, it's so important that we have the, the politicians within us when we're doing this transform uh, transformation because they are such a big push coming from the politicians. So in some countries, you still see that some of the politicians are fighting against this green shift. We need the politicians to be brave and be on board if we're going to reach these goals, because we need to speed up, and we can't do it fast enough without them. So the market is doing one thing, but we need the, the politicians to be on, and that is why we still have a struggle with politicians, I think, that, you know, fighting against this transformation. Can I just add one sentence to this? Please do. President Trump is probably the most famous politician against climate change in the world. It doesn't change the fact that because of the actions of companies and cities and states within the United States, they, the US will probably fulfill the Paris targets, mm -hmm. despite anything that President Trump has said uh, or done. So don't be discouraged by polit politicians who are not willing to be a part of this debate, I think they are gradually making themselves ir irrelevant. Maybe. <laughs> I can just back this up uh, by I facts know. from IEA. It <laughs> says that uh, actually the US yeah. has, uh, is the largest absolute decline among all countries since 2000. So yeah. they have actually done a lot, maybe not from the central government, from, the, from uh, subnational governments. But Indra, you are the political uh, scientist here. So President Grimson said that um, uh, the political world has lost control. Uh, Tina was basically pleading uh, for the politicians to, I would say, maybe regain control because the market needs it. Um, it's also been highlighted that, uh, that, of course, oil and gas has played a key role in international relations. Uh, uh, and in this transition that we are now moving towards, there will be winners and losers. And in, uh, in uh, President Grimson's presentation, he highlighted China mm -hmm. as the winner, but there will be losers also. If you can uh, add your perspective into this. Thanks, Hans Olaf. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I was on the research panel for the Global Commission, uh, uh, and uh, during the work of the Commission and also some previous processes, we suggested uh, doing a more detailed and systematic analysis of how different countries in the world might fare 
uh, with, uh, if we manage to carry out a full-scale uh, energy transition. Uh, and this has always been voted down because it's considered too diplomatically sensitive. Um, but uh, since I'm a researcher and I'm independent and I'm here of my own free will, I can uh, talk about it now. And we've uh, done this analysis uh, for our own account. It'll be published in a couple of weeks. And is a ranking of 156 countries in the world, uh, 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 with each country ranked according to who will win and lose most from energy transition. Uh, and what we find, which contrasts with a lot of other analyses that have been published, is that uh, China and the US are not going to do very well. Uh, so along with uh, Russia, for which the outlook is catastrophic, and for a lot of the major petroleum exporting countries, including most member states of OPEC, the, the outlook is also catastrophic, according to our analysis. Um, China and the US are not quite as bad, but also not very good. And one of the reasons for this, I think, is that people tend to think of these as major oil, net oil importers, which they are, but they forget that they are also very big oil consumers who also produce a lot of oil and gas themselves. And even more importantly, people tend to overfocus on oil. Uh, both China and the US and many other countries like Germany are heavily dependent on coal. And if coal is phased out, that's a big transition for them. Um, <clears throat> among the winners, we find countries uh, with a lot of uh, renewable energy uh, resources, and especially countries with a lot of space. And that's another thing we see, which, which is relevant for debates we're having now, for example, about wind turbines and about solar panels and where to place them, and people don't like having them in their backyard and so on, and that countries with space have an advantage. Uh, and interestingly, especially for Grimson maybe, um, we've, we've done a, this is a very technical, sophisticated analysis. We have five different versions of the index. Uh, we've been through a very heavy peer review with a lot of uh, discussion about formulas and so on. And no matter how we do the calculation, there is no country in the world which benefits as much as Iceland. <laughs> there are five versions of the index, Iceland is always the great winner. So maybe that's why he's so, so warmly promoting the energy transition. I thought also, I, I would also like to follow up some of the uh, some points that Tina and Samantha made. Tina spoke warmly for uh, carbon tax, or uh, for the, that polluting should cost, which I agree very much with, and Samantha talked about the, about the justice transition. And uh, we've had a very, we are having a very intense debate in this country about road tolls, which is maybe the biggest political issue in Norway at the moment. Uh, and many other countries have similar debates about jobs, or for example in France with the yellow vests and so on. And I think there's one thing that uh, 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 very many people on all sides of this debate tend to forget. Uh, even if you're very for carbon tax and all kinds of environmental taxes. It, when you raise those, you, it also makes sense to reduce some other taxes, because the aim isn't to impose as many taxes as possible on people. The aim is to shift the tax burden to uh, incentivize uh, uh, a transition to renewable energy and to uh, reducing emissions. So we need to have heavy carbon taxes, but then we also need to reduce other taxes, for example, on labor. Tina, before I bring in uh, some questions uh, from, uh, from the audience here, Tina? Uh, is, it doesn't necessarily have to be a tax. It's just that you put, when you actually price a product, you put the right price on that product where you include the cost of polluting as well. Mm. So it doesn't get so attracted, it will not attract as much investments. The investments will move to a direction where you have less cost connected to actually the uh, production, but also the consumption of that product. So it doesn't have to be a tax, because I totally agree that if you have one tax, you'd need to reduce another one. But this is just how you price a product from the start. Yeah. Samantha, you wanted to, uh, to come in there, but I'm, I'm also going to ask you a question. Um, Tom, 31 years old from New York, he's been up early today. Yeah. He's asked the question, should the climate con conscious movement be led by state governments, businesses, or civil society, or I guess also workers, if you can add this to, to the question. But then also feel free to, to come up with exactly the follow-up, uh, the previous discussion that we've had. 
Yeah. Well, first, uh, good morning, Tom. It's super early where you are. It's amazing that you got up to ask this question, but thanks for asking it. Um, I thought I heard a former general yesterday at this conference say more or less that power comes from below, and as a person who uh, you know, had some questions about the military-industrial complex, I was very surprised to hear this. Um, indeed, the transformation should not be led by, by businesses. Why? They're not democratic institutions. So, you know, as someone who personally believes deeply in democracy, it's a core value, um, and uh, also as, as someone in the trade union movement, that democracy is the key to everything. And all of the effort that it takes to engage people, citizens, workers, other groups in society, although most of us are workers selling our labor, um, that effort is worth it because if you can't get people on board to, in a democratic way to support um, societal aims like fighting climate change, you're going to see the situation that we have right now in the UK, in Brazil, in the United States, and in a number of other countries. So even if you aren't a big fan of grassroots organizing and democracy, we should all be doing our best to support it or to do it ourselves, because we're not going to get real action on climate change without it. We will always be fighting within our own movements and with our own people. Do I think governments should lead? I am a big believer in governments being democratically accountable to the people who elected them or to their citizens. And so in that sense, governments should always be the servants of people as opposed to imposing their, their will on people. That doesn't mean that governments can't also uh, show leadership and have agency. Sometimes that's necessary. The other thing I wanted to say more, this is about this issue of taxation. I mentioned the issue of fair tax. So that is an issue of uh, those who are profiting most from the way we've structured our economy and society paying the most tax and paying their fair share. And maybe looking at how we're distributing the profits of our economies and societies. Because the other thing that we're seeing is that people are, uh, in many countries again, people are rejecting, um, they're, they're rejecting the kinds of governments that could actually give us meaningful climate action because they're also rejecting the inequality, the rising inequality that we, that we see in different countries. And so it's important not only that um, the polluter pays, but it's also important that the burden of paying doesn't fall on poor, poor and working class people. Why? Because your choices about whether you're driving an old, highly polluting diesel vehicle in this country, those choices are systemic, right? I mean, it's not that you yourself are like, yes, I must have my 15-year-old Skoda, right? The, your choices are determined by your class position in the society and other things that are available to you. So, um, so I think some more deep thinking about how to structure uh, pollution taxes so that people support them and so that the burden of paying for pollution falls in the right place, which as our colleagues in the Swedish Union said today in a major article, should not really be falling on workers and poor and working class people, but rather other places. The last thing I want to say is we're spending a lot of time talking about unions resisting change. And in fact, last week we had a, a round table in, uh, in Sweden with the unions, the government, uh, CEOs from heavy emitting Swedish industry, where we talked, where Swedish unions were like, we embrace this change, we want Sweden to be the world's first fossil fuel free welfare state. We had the prime minister with us, a former welder, who also was announcing this as the goal of Sweden. So in the right conditions, where people are not afraid for their jobs and their families and their livelihoods, you know, we're ready for change. Right? So the question is, what is it that we have to do as societies so that working people are equally ready for change as they are in some of the Nordic countries, like Iceland, which has the world's highest union density at over 90%. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Before giving the floor to, uh, to Grimson here, I would just say that I had a previous minister that once said, we in the Norwegians, we are world champions in taxation. Mm. 
in the sense that we are really good at doing that. So it's, uh, that's why we have tax for development. Uh, but Grimson. Well, first of all, let me make clear I'm nothing against government uh, being very active in a positive way in this area. And of course, uh, they can play a very big role. I am simply saying that even if the government is uh, inactive or even opposed, we now have, due to technology and market opportunities, uh, the opportunities to do with ourselves. And we have, of course, examples, and I think India is a very good example, hasn't been mentioned so far, of how some years ago the Indian government started to take a lead in the solar power clean energy transformation of India. And many of us who tried to work with India on clean energy economy for years uh, had almost given up uh, on India. But the government-led solar power transformation in India in the last five years has, has been monumental, and in my opinion, one of the best examples. The United Arab Emirates is also an interesting example. The government there, 10 years ago, decided to become investors in clean energy in other countries. They are now this oil-rich, uh, gas-rich country, the largest solar investor in Spain. They are the largest foreign wind power investor uh, in Britain. And they have a systematic power of uh, encouraging smaller and medium-sized countries uh, in Africa, for example, of transforming over to, over to clean energy. So, of course, we have great examples of governments taking the lead. I am simply trying to get the message across because the media is so focused on Trump and other political leaders who are not active on this. People are almost giving up uh, in the struggle and in the transformation. And, of course, you're right, you have to name countries. And it took us a while in the Commission to decide in this report, because you were at one of the first meetings, we decided to name countries. And it was quite a diplomatic decision for the Commission, supported by the governments of Norway, Germany, and UA, if we were going to call spade a spade and actually point out and name countries. And let me also say, I think Norway should be very proud that your government and the participation by Hans Olaf and the foreign ministry and your experts in producing this report. This is probably one of the most important contributions Norway has made in the last 12 months okay. to the internet. And I say this because I'm pretty familiar with the global scene in this. In building the foundation for a transformative case that the relationship between the climate campaign and energy can be presented on the basis of evidence in this, in this positive way. But I must also say, I have never really believed that taxation is going to solve this. I was a finance minister in my earlier life, and I was the most unpopular politician in my country for a number of years. <laughs> Taxation is never popular, however the, the good intention. And we have spent a lot of effort on carbon tax and analysis and debate about it backwards and forwards. And many people believe that without the taxation reforms in this way, we would never succeed. I think the good news, partly described in this report, is that the technological progress plus the driving force of the market, as well as the fear of pollution for those who actually experience horrible pollutions in their everyday life, has become a very strong driving force uh, to, to in, in this process. But the core message, which I sometimes find lacking in the public debate, including the youth demonstrations, is to keep the focus on energy, because really, my friends, this is all about energy. And that is a focus we cannot lose. If we talk about other issues in the climate debate, uh, it will help those who are still wested to the old energy structure to keep that energy structure in power. We have to speed up the energy transformation if we are going to win this battle against uh, irreversible um, climate change. 
Thank you for bringing in uh, this uh, perspective on, uh, again, reiterating the point that it's all about uh, energy and also that taxation and removing subsidies is easy to talk about. It's a lot more difficult to actually do it. And we've seen governments being toppled uh, by protest when they try to remove even small subsidies. So it's a, it's a really critical issue uh, that we need to address. But um, uh, Indra, you wanted to... Uh, respond to something, but yeah. I also have a question from you from Sofia29 in Copenhagen. Uh, it was actually mentioned here, so I, that's why I'm bringing it in. Is it more difficult to be a researcher on energy and green transition after fake news became normalized? Mm. Um, well, <laughs> first, uh, to this question, um, I think uh, the news media have been deteriorating for a long time, so I don't think this is a uh, a new development, okay. although it has worsened, and I don't find that it has a negative impact on my work or on my possibility for communicating okay. uh, publicly about then it. Then we've responded to Sophia. Thanks for the question, Sophia. Um, uh, yeah, I want to touch on this, the role of politicians and, and the drivers here, and I think it, both in that context and other contexts, it's very important, uh, I think, to to see that we have a paradoxical situation. On the one hand, there are many actors, many of Tina's former colleagues, many people in the IEA, who just don't understand what's going on. They don't understand how fast solar power is being rolled out. They don't understand the role that offshore wind is going to play. They don't understand that there's going to be major innovations in energy storage in the near future. So they don't understand it, and every time the IEA, the International Energy Agency, publishes a new World Energy Outlook. Everybody who does know about this stuff laughs a lot on Twitter and elsewhere uh, and makes lots of jokes about it because we know all the forecasts are wrong. And they're usually proven wrong within a few months, not after 10 years. So in this sense, it, things are going very well. And as Grimson is saying, um, even when governments are against, technology, cities, companies, citizens are taking uh, the issue in their own hand and, uh, hands and are moving forward faster than many people understand. That's on the one hand. However, the paradox is that even when you take in all of this, we're not moving fast enough. The situation looks very bad. Maybe there are going to be very big new innovations which will solve anything, but so far we don't have them. So far we mostly have incremental innovation, and we are not moving fast enough. Doesn't mean that it would be impossible or even extremely difficult to move fast enough, but it would take more than we're doing today. And therefore I think that it is wonderful what we have and what people are doing, and it's important to show those who, who, the, who are uh, very, um, who, who underestimate current developments, what is really going on. At the same time, we have to be realistic uh, that we are not doing enough. And to, to do enough, uh, we need governments to come in. And I think this is going to happen. Uh, and I think it's going to happen at the level of international politics, which is, where, which is where it has to happen. And I think it's going to come in the form of a climate club, which is uh, one of the ideas of William Nordhaus, who won the Nobel Prize in economics last year, uh, but which has received relative or very little attention in general. But in a few years from now, we're going to be talking about climate clubs, and the question is going to be which countries are going to be leading this initiative, which countries are going to be on the outside, and what are the sanctions going to be against the outsiders. And finally, what I see is the smart actors are already positioning themselves for this. Some countries are moving forwards, developing renewable energy industries, cutting their own emissions, and so on. And as they succeed, they are going to have, apart from climate change, apart from everything else, they are going to have a vested interest in promoting climate clubs to have morally legitimate reasons uh, to promote themselves economically and keep others out. And I think the smart actors are positioning for that. And at a personal level, also positioning themselves. So I remember Tina was kind of the rebel among the oil analysts. Uh, now she's working on sustainable finance. And I think some of your old colleagues think that you are a bit kind of, a, you know, uh, idealist and not realist and so on. I would say it opposite. I think you're following the money. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so
Samantha and Tina, you were in hot pursuit of something Indra said. So Samantha, I'll start yes. with you. Well, there is a big debate right now about the work of William Nordhaus, as you know. So I'm not sure that the, the, uh, his work is exactly the model we want to be following, since he was the person who sort of socialized the idea that two degrees was okay, and we're seeing that at just over a degree, it's actually very far from okay for uh, a lot of countries, uh, mostly, mostly developing countries. But having said that, I want to say one other thing about the role of government. So a government that is really serving people, and in almost every country, people are super worried about climate change, as they should be. Like, we should all be frightened about climate change. Um, that government would also be acting decisively in the interests of citizens and having industrial strategy that is going to help us to drive these changes in a much faster way than we're seeing right now. So probably, Your Excellency, we might disagree about exactly what makes markets and how much they're the creation of, uh, of human actions and policies, but it's very clear that, for example, in this country, we had a hydropower and heavy industry revolution, which was about industrial strategy. We had an oil and gas revolution, which was about industrial strategy. And now we need another revolution, which is going to be about building on the jobs that we have today and the industries, the knowledge, the workforce. And it's going to have different aspects. It will have offshore wind, potentially. It will have carbon capture and storage. It will have maybe battery factories. It will have a lot of different things. But that's it's not going to happen without decisive action, because if the market were really sorting this all out for us, we would not have heard, as we heard this morning from you, Hans Olaf, the global emissions are going up. And by the way, they're also going up in the US, outside of the power sector. They're going up from transport and heavy industry, and we have quite large methane emissions, it seems, from the oil and gas sector now. So we need government action. We need governments that are democratically accountable to people. And we also need to understand that this transition, um, if, if it takes on this element of social justice and just transition, it will be faster as opposed to slower. Because to the people who say, you don't have time for a just transition, I want to say, how is that working out for you right now in some of these countries? How fast is it actually going where people are against you and not with you? Thank you. Tina, I... <laughs> You also wanted to follow up. I see the clock is ticking, and this is uh, we are the only ones keeping you away from your well deserved lunch and your continued the, the discussions that you're going to have in the other room. But I'll so then I'll invite my panelists to maybe come up with a one minute uh, last intervention. But uh, I'll start with you, Tina, because you also wanted to follow up something I think Indra said. Uh, yes, because I think it's so important that we actually have the politicians on now. We have a very short window, I will say about five years, maximum ten, when all the new technology to actually be reaching the Paris Agreement and the sustainability goals need to be uh, developed and be produced and out in the market. We have a very, very short period of time. And what I'm afraid of, if you just let it go or, or leave, leave it all to the market, it's not moving fast enough. Uh, because now we, what we're seeing, for example, in this country and other um, fossil fuel producing countries is that the um, politicians are a bit afraid to take the brave decisions that we have to do. And what was happening now that we're leaning back and wait somebody else to take the decision for us, they will not do that. So in the meantime, we're losing you know, the window when it's open to develop this technology, we're also losing a big opportunity here to build new industries, to build new jobs for the people living in these countries. So I think, you know, uh, it's, it's so important that we actually get the politicians on board and they need to make brave decisions together with the industry and uh, uh, now. Yeah. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, I also got a question from Alfredo in, from, in Oslo. Um, he wants uh, you to address uh, how that we're not leaving um, indigenous people out of the question. If you could briefly mention that in your closing statement, then I go to Indra and, and then uh, President Grimson uh, at the last. Yeah, not just indigenous people, other people, other groups who are marginalized yep. in society, right? Um, thank you for the question. It's a really, it's, it's a critical question also for the union movement. So I can give you a good example, but also to say we have a lot to do in our movement 
on exactly on exactly this issue and on issues of uh, of inclusion in general. Um, in New Zealand, New Zealand is a country with uh, dual sovereignty. So you have sovereignty of the Maori people and you have sovereignty of the colonial settlers of European descent. And uh, that's reflected in their constitution, the political structures. It is also, I'm proud to say, reflected in the trade union movement, where we have, a, we have one trade union movement with dual structures, with a Maori union structure and a Pakeha or a settler union structure. And the positions of the New Zealand unions on just transition are very informed and in some cases driven by uh, the um, spiritual and uh, cultural and political positions of the Maori, but also about the need to make sure that in, when no one is left behind, we really have to mean that, yeah. right? And so in all the things that we do as unions, we have to ensure that we are uh, acting, not just promoting, but acting to make sure that people who are historically excluded from, uh, from work, from decent work, and from the economy, who are excluded politically, that they are, that they are put forward. And that's everything from apprenticeships, earmarking a certain amount of apprenticeships for people from historically marginalized communities, which a lot of our construction unions actually do, for example, in Canada, the US, and so on, um, all the way up to how we make decisions and whose voice gets heard. So we have a, we have a long way to go, but, um, but it's the right question to be asking us and to challenge us on. Okay, Indra, short closing statement from you. I think a world running almost only on renewable energy is going to be structurally, fundamentally, a much more peaceful place in terms of international affairs. But the process of getting there, as assets are stranded, is, could be very, very bumpy. And the less prepared countries are, the more bumpy it could be. Some countries could collapse internally and it could have consequences for their neighbors and partners. And uh, so we need to be prepared for a bumpy ride on energy transition. And when it comes to climate politics, for decades, we've had nice negotiations where everybody has a veto. And most countries would agree, but some countries would be against it. Oh, sorry, so you don't like it all. What can we do to please you to make you join this? In the future, things may be different. So on the specifics of Nordhaus, it's a very, his approach is also very technical in economics and so on. Uh, my point is that I think we are going to end up in a climate club scenario. There are going to be insiders and outsiders, and it might not be as soft as things have been in the past. And that's the only hope I see for how to deal with the climate issue. Thank you. President Grimson, I give you the last uh, word uh, from Indra's bumpy ride until we'll see. Well, of course, it is nice to talk about Iceland and Norway. <laughs> But let's realize uh, we are in a small uh, luxury corner uh, of the world. And although Europe and the United States, uh, through their uh, fossil fuel, oil, coal uh, dependent economies, have largely produced this problem because of the uh, economic uh, fossil fuel dependent transformation in the 20th century, it's very important for us to realize that this battle will be won or lost in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. <laughs> because of the huge population growth in these three parts of the world, and the alarming speed of urbanization. And just look at the predictions of urbanization and populations in Africa towards the end of this, of this century. So my final message is really this. We must not lose sight here in the Nordic countries or in Europe that we really have to engage with Asia, Africa, and Latin America in order to have a hope of not only saving the planet, but also saving the Arctic. And having sp spending so much of my time on Arctic cooperation is kind of paradoxical that Asia, Africa, and Latin America will have more impact on the future of the Arctic than Norway uh, or, or Iceland. Mm. Because the ice will continue to melt. And as I say to my American friends, 
The ice is neither Republican or a Democrat. It simply continues to melt. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Tina wants 15 seconds. Yeah, very short. Uh, I just uh, ask you to please uh, be critical to the products and uh, the services you're buying, because we could all do something. So when you buy something in the shop, ask questions about where it's made, what kind of products it's made of, how is it transported, what kind of energy they're using, and ask questions to us in the financial industry. What do we do with your money? Where do we invest them? And which companies are we lending money to? We could all do something about this. Thank you. Let me just uh, thank the panelists uh, for a great exchange. If someone wants a copy of the report, it's uh, sitting here, and we'll probably get some more as well if it's needed. I think this has been a really great debate, and I think my key take-home message that I hope that you will all remember, it's all about energy. Of course, it's a little bit more, but energy is important. If we don't transform the energy sector, then we are in serious problems, but it's lots of opportunities, and we have to get it right, and we all have to work together. Thank you.